Welcome to this ninth week of our course. Um, this week focuses on game theory, and in particular video games. Um, last week we did an activity with augmented reality. We did that Vokey. Um, so I haven't seen your Vokeys yet, but I hope they worked out well. But uh, this week I'm just focusing on video games. And I have several readings posted to Blackboard about uh, video games. I noticed that my readings um, uh, pertain to secondary teachers more, well, from secondary journals, but I think the ideas that are in them will also apply to the elementary grades. So, um, so I hope you find this week's activities interesting. All right. Um, so here's uh, some of what I understand about game theory. I'm not a video uh, gamer myself, and uh, the last game I played, I think, was Pac-Man, other than on occasion, you know, uh, looking at something. But I haven't really been engaged in any uh, video games. But here's uh, some overview about the theory and the application to teaching and learning. So in engagement theory in general, um, when people have choice, even structured choice, doesn't have to be wild, open choice, but giving them some choice of what to do, it in increases engagement, and there's lots of research showing that. Then similarly, when people have some control over what they're learning in terms of time, place, in terms of the kind of activity that they do, uh, it increases engagement, all right? So you know yourself, you feel better if you can select the time to participate in activities for this course as opposed to me assigning a certain time. All right. Problem solving. This relates to everything you know about higher level questioning and thinking in classrooms. Um, the higher level the task, the more likely that you engage students in learning. So in uh, literacy, we do a lot with strategy instruction, and very metacognitive, and that's problem-oriented. Uh, family literacy. Uh, this slide might be a bit of a stretch, but it, um, when families are involved in activities, students tend to learn uh, the task very well, or children learn the task very well. So video game games are is a new kind of activity, at least certainly in the last 10, 15 years, that families often do together. And uh, there's a lot of uh, research showing about family literacy. And if you think of game theory as a form of literacy, um, you could refer to the work of Heath, uh, Shirley Bryce Heath from Stanford, Catherine Snow from Harvard, and this is Denny Taylor, who I think just retired from Hofstra. Then you probably know, I think we referred to this earlier in the semester, this the basic, um, did the, note, the concept of digital natives and digital immigrants, that today's uh, K through 12 student is really a digital native, and I'm a digital immigrant. Um, it's an interesting concept, doesn't always apply. You know, some older people are really good with technology and some uh, children for might be a, a, an issue of social equ equity and access. I'm not sure, but they may be less involved with technology. And then there's also the, just the general issue, the more specific issue. Sometimes children are great with video games, but they can't keyboard, right? And it, uh, you know yourself, you probably have peers that are great with Facebook and uh, texting, but they don't know some of the web tools that you know. Multimodality. One of the biggest differences in today's literacy is that it's multimodal. So right now you're looking at a video that I've made, and so it's visual, it's oral, and it's movement. And the work of, I think it's uh, Cress. I forget his first name, but if you're interested in that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Cress is the researcher you would look up. And uh, there's a lot of common sense to multimodality, that good teaching has always been more than just saying something. 
It's been saying something, showing it, having students do it, having them discuss it. So the notion of multimodality is an old concept in teaching, but with the digital literacies, uh, that's actually one of what uh, they say it's one of its affordances. And uh, digital literacy and game, um, gaming, it's better when it's social. I, I think you probably play in, uh, independently of others, but it's much better when you compete, and that increases engagement. Um, engagement is increased when users are emotionally involved. And as you can see in that photo, the kids are emotionally involved. And gaming seems to do that, at least some games. This is a concept that you should know. I, mean, I hate to say should, but um, it's a psychological concept of engagement. And it's called flow. I can't pronounce the man's name, uh, though the pronunciation is quite easy. But I always forget it because there seems to be little relationship between the spelling and the pronunciation. So, but flow is when you lose yourself in a book, when you lose yourself in a game. By losing yourself, I mean you forget time and space and several hours will pass and uh, before you know it. So this researcher, the psych learning psychologist, says if we could somehow create a, a state of flow when we're teaching our subject areas, that would be great. Students would get so involved. Contextualized learning. Uh, I'll talk about the opposite to uh, make it, uh, to explain it. Schools often decontextualize learning, so we give kids skill sheets, workbooks, uh, practice exercises, but we tend to not give them authentic learning activities where a particular concept or strategy would be applied in a real world setting. So we tend to decontextualize learning rather than contextualize it. But all the research shows that learning's better when it's contextualized. So gaming fits that pattern where it creates, you know, um, like a virtual reality and students, uh, children like it. Uh, this comes from the work of this slide from the work of Paul G. And uh, he argues about the importance of narrative that good games have a story and you're participating in that story or narrative and that increases the engagement and the enjoyment of the game. And this real uh, challenging, this relates to the earlier slide about uh, higher level thinking that easy tasks tend to be uh, less engaging, uh, though maybe immediately when you first try you say this is a snap but you're more likely to engage students in a game or any learning activity if it requires higher level um, thinking. Uh, time. Time is a factor. It probably fits in with flow. It uh, comes from the work of John Carroll from Harvard. And I think this is uh, 1963. is a famous paper. And he argues that most people can learn anything given sufficient time and good guidance. So by increasing time, uh, students can learn what would be fractions, decimals, percent, algebra, and all kinds of algorithms or whatever it would be. And with gaming, I think many of adults aren't good at, good at it because we don't devote time to it. But children are good at games because of the time they uh, spend learning the games and practicing them. So here's a bibliography on uh, games, and that's the slideshow. So I hope uh, that overview uh, is helpful in terms of game theory, and maybe we could extend those concepts to classroom teaching and learning.